Instead, we have the opportunity to make a habit of empathy, to recognize ourselves and each other. Encyclopedia Britannica laughed at Wikipedia. Open Commons, we remember Garrett Hardin. You don't, you, no one will participate in the Commons because the freeloaders will take over, correct? Well, apparently the young people never heard about Garrett Hardin and the tragedy of the Commons because all over the world, millions of them, millions of them are sharing knowledge on Wikipedia and the error rate isn't much different than Encyclopedia Britannica, which is top down. And Bill Gates over at Microsoft didn't really pay attention to the Scandinavian hippies who put together Linux, which is open source. If you have problems with the code, we'll share the code and we'll help each other. It's now a world player. This is a third industrial revolution. Distributed communication, organizing distributed energy, gives rise to distributed consciousness. What is happening all over the world in school systems? Here in Sonoma and around the world, our young people are being taught something totally new in the last 10 years, five years. They're being taught every single day that everything they do, the food they eat, the clothes they wear, the electricity they use, the family car they drive in, every single thing they do intimately affects the well-being of someone else or some other creature in some other part of the world. It allows us to take responsibility, each of us, for that small swath of the biosphere that's in our backyard. So we each are responsible for the energy that bathes the earth and sustains life. But we share it. So we now become responsible for all the energy together. It's entrepreneurial, but it's collaborative. Let me say one more thing about this on politics. When President Obama first said that he was that empathy was his philosophy, and then the right-wing talk shows went after him, and he shut up ever since. This was during the, the, the justice. What, what folks on the far right don't understand, they think empathy means, oh, communism, collectivism. Empathy requires individuality and selfhood. The more you develop the self, and the more the self has an understanding of its own identity, the more existentially we can then relate to another person's existential moment and then associate with them. And I should say, on the left, when we hear the word individual sometimes, people on the left, they say, oh, selfish, libertarian, Ayn Rand crowd. <laughs> but the point is that selfhood and individuality go with empathy. Empathy is the social glue that allows an increasingly individualized population to integrate into more complex civilizations. It's the real invisible hand. That's the real invisible hand. To Civilize is to empathize. To empathize is to civilize. So where do we go from here? We have a problem. 50% of the human race, us, we're living very high up on the chain here on this planet with a big carbon footprint. I'm not Mother Teresa. All right? On the other hand, 40% of the human race is living on $2 a day and less and barely able to survive low carbon footprint. So the question is, how do we find a way for half the human race to live more sustainably so the other half of the human race can go to the threshold and we meet? I think the key is revisiting the concept of what makes us happy. Now, John Locke said, if one negates nature, acquires property, becomes self-sufficient, one becomes happy. Because in those days, we defined freedom all the way up to today as autonomy and mobility. That's why we love the automobile, all right? Freedom. Freedom means the ability to be self-sufficient, an island to oneself, correct? Mm -hmm. But today, we're beginning to understand that an empathic approach to freedom is very different. We begin to define freedom not as autonomy, because the more autonomous we are, the more isolated we become. If freedom is optimizing the full potential of one's life, right, that a good idea? Freedom is the optimizing the full potential of one's life. That full potential is optimized by the richness of one's relationships, the variety of one's experiences, and the deeper one is able to explore the mysteries of existence, huh? Mm -hmm. That idea about freedom requires inclusivity, not exclusivity. It requires an environment that's open, it redefines strength not as invulnerability, John Wayne, but as vulnerability, openness, and the willing to trust so that people can communicate at the deepest level of their being. So, when that young college pre-med, remember after the Iran elections, 
after they ran elections, they were flawed. There were protests of students in the street. And one young girl was gunned down. She was a pre-med, co-ed, pre-med student. And someone happened to take a cell phone video of her being killed. Within an hour, across the world, on Twitter and YouTube, the entire generation of young people were empathizing with the young men and women protesters on the street of Iran. That's files for consciousness. But the problem is, we have to ask ourselves, how do we bring the human race together? We think happiness. The new studies on happiness show that if you're really poor, you're not happy. Because you're barely eking out of survival, you don't have a lot of empathic reserves to think about the polar bears. As you get wealthier, you get happier. But when we reach a threshold of minimum comfort, what happens after that, increasing increments of wealth, less and less happy. And at some critical point, more and more wealth, more and more isolated. So apparently John Locke and the Enlightenment philosophers got it wrong when they said more acquisition of wealth, happier and happier. What we need to do is we're going to need to find a new dream. This is going to be hard to do in this country, but the American dream does not work for the 21st century. It's based on 18th century Enlightenment ideas that we are all utilitarian, materialistic, self-interested, personal agents. Therefore, the American dream is every individual ought to have the opportunity to get ahead and succeed. End of story. But if real freedom and real happiness is optimizing the full extent of one's relationships and more meaningful communities, then what we find is happiness, the dream, is not individual opportunity to succeed alone, but something we call quality of life. Over and over with young people in pockets around the world, I hear them say, I want quality of life. Quality of life does not exclude the individual, but requires the individual take responsibility not only for themselves, but for the public good in the public square. We are seeing a generation of young people who are moving for and voting for quality of life. With quality of life, we can extend it to the entire human race. So half the human race, we can learn to live more sustainably. Quality of life allows us to do that. And the rest of the human race can get up to the threshold and we meet there. The most, the happiest societies we find are complex, well integrated, completely connected, and willing to tax themselves so there's a small gap between the rich and the poor. And the smaller the gap, the happier the countries. Think Norway, Denmark, and in our hemisphere, Costa Rica is an interesting example. We're not even on the chart on happiness in the United States because we rank 27th out of 30 countries in income disparity, the OECD. Only Turkey, Mexico, and Portugal have a greater disparity of wealth than the United States of America now. That's shameful. It wasn't the way it was when I was a kid. So, we need to move quickly. We have various levels of consciousness around the human race. Not too many with mythological consciousness, although we still put salt over the shoulder and do weird things like that. But we, we still have theological consciousness. We have ideological consciousness. We have psychological consciousness. Our kids are getting into dramaturgical consciousness. All these levels of consciousness in each one of us. How do we bring us all together to biosphere consciousness? I believe the threat of the biosphere may be enough to jolt us, hopefully, into the next stage of our development. But the question is, what are we using this internet for? And all of these technologies that are, are we just using the internet for more information, more entertainment, and better commerce? Are we just introducing the new renewable energies because we want to be more sufficient in our home and have cheaper energy bills? If that's it, that's not really a good reason to connect the whole human race in terms of our communication and our energy. It's not transcendent, it's dumbing down. We have to ask, what is the purpose of these new distributed communication and energy technologies? Perhaps it's to bring us together to have a great global conversation on rethinking human nature, getting back to our core being, homo empathicus, and developing parenting styles and school models and business models and governing models that reflect what a human being really is at our core. And the way we know these scientists are right is the deathbed test, as my wife says. On our deathbed, when we look back at life, when we're old, I'm old, I'm going to be 65 next week, when you start looking back, we don't look back at the precious moments when we made a cut a deal, we made another buck, spent another hour at the office, as my wife says to me, of course, <laughs> as, we, <laughs> as we had another autonomous moment or experience self-interest. Those aren't the photographs that are edged in our memory. It's the empathic moments. Absolutely. With another human, it could be with our companion dog, a fellow creature. That's when we transcend ourselves 
and we partake in the mystery, the awe of existence. <laughs>